This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Richard Dynan. He is founder and CEO of Pulsar Fusion, and he's looking at offering the human race a neat new way of getting around our solar system and maybe beyond. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure to have you here. Uh, so can you give us just a brief look at what is Pulsar Fusion and what is it that you folks are hoping to do? Pulsar is a uh, British-based in-space propulsion company. So we focus on, once you've launched and you're in orbit, we focus on those kind of propulsion systems. Um, so principally, that is stage two rocket engines. Uh, we, we, we build liquid hydrogen and um, uh, hybrid hybrid rocket motors. Uh, and we also focus, we have a, a big department in, in electric propulsion. So uh, a Hall effect thrusters specifically, which is a type of plasma um, uh, engine. But Pulsar is called Pulsar Fusion because we have an, uh, an overriding moonshot ambition of nuclear fusion for propulsion, which makes us pretty unique. It also makes us unique in fusion because a lot of fusion companies are betting everything on um, one route to fusion, if you like. And, you know, there will be many, uh, many routes. But also, uh, as an investor, it, it's kind of make or break. Whereas we have our, uh, our, our fusion drive ambition, we also have a good, good pulse um, business beneath that. And, you know, we really listen to what the market uh, is looking for. Mm -hmm. And as you alluded to, I mean, you folks do some different types of engines, including liquid hydrogen and more familiar ion engines, and as well as your nuclear fusion technologies. Can you just give, give us a brief look at what some of the advantages and disadvantages are of each type of propulsion system and why you need more yeah, so, Well, we came very, uh, the journey was um it was a very important uh when you've got a lot of physicists around you um that you know everybody's excited by a lot of technology and it's very important to say no because <laughs> <laughs> um, otherwise you'd be building all sorts of things so it's our, our, the technologies we have chosen to invest in are very strategic to us um and we addressed each one uh you know, there's a lot of things we've, we've looked at we addressed each one um carefully before we've invested in it uh to touch on the rocket engines that came second we actually um we primarily started with e with ep because our nuclear fusion scientists are all plasma physicists right so um the study of electromagnetic uh confinement of plasma is very very relevant to hall effect thrusters uh, and those scientists uh, have a really uh, a great pedigree to be building ion engines and it gives us, you know, we've got the vacuum chambers. Um, we've got all the uh, simulation studies uh, and we've got all the sort of clean room apparatus and the things that you, the same things you need for fusion, uh, you need for EP. So that was very logical for us. Um, we didn't necessarily set out uh, to make a market uh, in the smaller engines we build now. We started off with very large Hall effect thrusters. I mean, the largest and uh, as we sort of, our main study was in longevity, wasn't in making them live longer. Uh, sorry, it wasn't in making them more powerful necessarily, because I think there's, there's kind of a glass ceiling to where you can take uh, electrostatic propulsion, but um, it was more making them live longer. If you're going to spend the money to put something in space, uh, you want it to be able to survive 15 years. And, and the material science behind that grew our EP for us. So that it was a pretty pretty easy for us to... To, to continue doing something that there was a clear demand for. Um, and we got a lot of support from the UK government, the space agency behind that. It's made some pretty amazing partnerships um, recently with the University of Michigan. Uh, and we've done um, a lot of the British Center for Excellence. Uh, so that's it's a really exciting place to be um, with Hall of Fame. Rocket engines, uh, again, came to us because from our success with EP, we found that there are not many people in this part of the world who are seriously building stage two rocket engines. And, and again, if you're putting things into space, whether it be for asteroid mining or, or all sorts of 
end sort of cislunar uh, missions, you do want there, there are, there's got to be other ways of navigating, and we don't travel meaningful distances in space by setting fire to things. Uh, <laughs> it's very good for getting us up there, but once we're there, you want something more efficient or something that can refuel in orbit, um, which is which is where the demand came for us with with your personnel and facilities. Can you build this tech? So again, we started doing these tests in about 2020. Uh, you see sort of our rocket engines doing test fires in Switzerland in the snow, uh, which was very unique. But uh, that, that, again, is something we, we again, focus on specifically strategic stage two engines. Um, and fusion is, for us, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's, um, it, it, can you do fusion for energy is the question I think a lot of people are, have on their mind. And we can. Um, you know, you saw the, the success at the NIFT facilities and been more, there'll be more and more. Uh, but ultimately, the myth of, you know, can we do it? Can we achieve the conditions? Yeah, we absolutely can. And we'll do more and more of it. The people at least because, okay, well, when will it power our homes then if this is happening? The problem is, is once you've got the condition of fusion, turning that into a power station, a serious uh, industrial, you know, it's a federal sized um massive power station a power station infrastructure thing and, and they always take 10 to 15 years just whether they be fission or fusion it's a federal sized game and sometimes it's best to uh you know that that's not where we we wanted to be involved in but if you kind of get that same initial condition of fusion what we call fusion triple product or um lawson criteria i mean a different ways of setting or level q um, to get a fusion burn, then you can use that same condition to create exhaust speeds, which are you know, an order of magnitude. I mean, 10x plus uh, the the speeds we currently get from our Hall effect thrusters. But more importantly, apart from the speed, you get the, a bit more of the sort of the, the mass. For, for example, um, the whole effect thrusters give you that super fast, about 32 kilom kilometers a second in particle speeds. But to get, get there would take 100 years to get to that speed. You know, it's a very slow acceleration, whereas a rocket engine gives you that kick instantly. So we haven't got anything that does both. Fusion is the only technology um, that really could mean that we could leave our solar system within a human lifetime, whether that's something we'd want to do. Uh, it's more not a, we say things about going to Mars or going to Saturn. That's sort of to get people's head around the speed. The most important thing is um, getting to a point in space quicker than someone else or faster to make things commercial. Or if I can save you time and space, uh, I can save you money. So um, for us, there's no other tech that we can seriously consider. We can definitely get those conditions of fusion requires. So with or without us, we're using fusion for propulsion. As, I mean, as humanity, we will be doing that. Mm, and you're talking about, as you as you mentioned, like the this could give us the ability to go to Mars in weeks rather than uh, months, or you know, making this whole journey back and forth be you know a matter of weeks, like a cruise. Yeah, I mean. We, 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 the analogies are calculated, you know, you get to Saturn's moon, Titan, or in, in, I think it takes eight years is reduced to two. That's what the math said. But again, I mean, this is, there's, you know, there's, there's like deceleration, there's in-orbit assemblies to consider, there's um, lots of things like that. But, you know, I, I think those missions are, people say, why well, don't want to get to Mars or why well, don't want to get Saturn? Um, you know, there are there are ways of doing fusion where perhaps you could use some kind of inertial confinement concepts where you're colliding asteroids in you know and you're slingshotting around planets and all of this is very elegant and 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 interesting but actually once you're in space space is a massive place right and to travel anywhere meaningful uh setting fire to things and combustion rockets is is ultimately not the right way of you know we know that nature the stars we follow the direction you've got to emulate them and 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 fusion is nature's chosen power source um the sun is a fusion reactor so we know that's the way to go um we just haven't really had the tech i mean now 
now we have the ability to to get as you see we, we can get there now so using it for propulsion is, is a much more near-term application than using it for energy we don't need a huge power station or steam turbines we don't need to breed our own tritium we don't need to have um maybe two engines and robotic hand or seawater flush out so we don't need neutron um you know to ca capture the neutron uh, uh kinetic energy for heat we don't need to have the locals to sign off on it the governments to finance it we don't, all of that is the enormous time lag of energy we can just build it in a chamber test to make sure that we're getting those exhaust speeds and then we we look for an in-orbit demonstration hmm. so what are some of the uh challenges that you're facing now in trying to get nuclear fusion engine so running when you say the word fusion uh, people immediately think, okay, 20 years from now. Um, Pulsar is very, very careful about not assuming uh, new feats in physics. Um, if, as an investor myself, as somebody who understands, I guess I come more from a, uh, a business side than I do from a physics side, um, it has to make sense. And I want to see companies take an achievable bit of physics or technology go away and do that on time and on budget, come back and say that we did what we said and avoid jumping down rabbit holes or becoming a very expensive science project. And the biggest risk for an investor is that they find themselves funding a, a big science project. And, and that's not something that any investor wants to do. So Pulsar takes technology, uh, takes, so with, with Fusion, we take conditions that have already been achieved somewhere in the world. And we say, we're going to repeat that but we're going to do that in the, uh, the setup or configuration rather than for energy for propulsion. Um, we're not assuming that we can get a hundred times the temperature than what has been achieved at a government facility. I mean, it's a nice, bright, rosy future one day if you can. But if I was an investor, I would say not with my money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we want to say this was done in this reactor by these people. Time has come on. We've got better tech. We want to achieve just the same thing, and then we'll come back to you. And 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 that's how we fund it. And and importantly, it's a different audience to to um, uh, power for power because there's a different set of interested parties. Because if I can sell a technology which gets you to a point in space, say at half the time as your competitor, whether it be a competitive country or a competitive business or whatever, uh, you know, you can charge for that. Um, and there are people that need to see if, the te if this technology is possible, because if it is, um, you know, they ha you have to own a piece of that. And um, the, the simple thing is this, can humanity do fusion? If we can't, this is all a waste of time. But we can, we can do fusion. And if you can do fusion, then propulsion is inevitable. It's it's easier to get the particle speed because that same speed uh, is some, is the first step in energy. You know, if you want to do energy, you have to convert that speed into heat and then heat into power and all of this. And then you've got to have something that sustains itself and breeds its own fuels and becomes efficient. We don't need it to be efficient. We can buy our own fuel, pay someone to breed them because it's worth it. We can even sustain our reaction using a maybe a fission reactor if we wanted to, um, because ultimately if this if this it doesn't need to net generate, you know, I can lose money, but charge more because the speed is what I'm getting. Uh, so there are a lot of things going for it. But the biggest, I know you asked about challenges. I just want to get to the biggest yeah, advantage yeah. is that if you look at any fusion experiment, most of the money and the weight and the size of it is in getting vacuum equipment. You know, we have at Pulsar all these really expensive vacuum facilities. And, you know, you are a leak detector is half a million pounds, if not more. And you've got all these systems just to get a vacuum, a really high vacuum is seriously expensive and very challenging and can easily go wrong. And it's done in many fusion experiments. And then that's one part of it. Now, space is a vacuum. So it's a perfect vacuum. So if, if, if you want to do a fusion experiment, space is the perfect place to do it. And you're going to save a ton of money and a ton of time doing the experiments in space. Secondly, the other side of any fusion, any fusion um, uh, project is usually you read about historic fusion uh, attempts and people go away, they raise some money, 
they come back and they say, we had a great result, but we would like some more money because we need bigger magnets. Uh, it's, it's magnet, magnetism is the other side of fusion. It's the muscle. It, it compensates for what we don't understand in a plasma in confinement. It's a bit like a weather system. It's chaos. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's fluid dynamics. It's magnetic hydrodynamics. It's these incredibly complicated studies of a system we know we don't know anything about. So it's almost like the stock market. If you think you know, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> it's when you know you don't know that you can actually start doing something with it. And it's exactly the same with fusion inside the chamber. Once you realize you don't understand, but you can do tricks to compensate to, uh, you know, lots of little innovations that we've seen at universities that can just make the, the reaction more efficient, knowing that we don't understand. So um, the, the, the other side of that, of the understanding is magnets, because magnets, you can literally just power your way into confinement or control. And some people believe that sometimes magnetic power might just be get the studying the plasma, we're never going to understand it, just force it into submission with magnets. Uh, and you can get there. However, magnets, superconducting, you know, rare earth ma magnets, are they need to be kept at a very, very low temperature. Right. And that is expensive. You're going to run liquid nitrogen through the space is zero Kelvin. So, right. so well, not everywhere, but where we're using it, it is, that's minus 275 degrees. It's the perfect place to have superconducting magnets. So effectively, putting fusion in space may originally make people raise eyebrows, but I am so much better off doing it there than doing it on Earth, exactly. and I'll be a, a lot quicker. Right. Challenges? Uh, I guess our major challenge right now is, I guess, demonstrating it, not um, coming back with a... And they, what we don't want to do is raise money from investors and then promise something and not deliver it, which is something so far we haven't done. But we've got a long way to go. And, you know, I don't want to be coming back to you in a couple of years time and say, oh, guess what? We almost had a great result. But we're very, very disciplined as a team. Um, and I think we, we know, I like to say we, we have a good chance of, of hitting our milestones along the way, which will mean that by 2027, we would be fundraising for an in-orbit demonstration. Uh, so we, we right now we have the chamber in our facilities in England. Um, we've also got, because of the Eurofusion uh, drive and, and, and ETA, uh, a huge um, talent pool of, of nuclear fusion and, and plasma physicists in England, which is why it's such a good infusion. So we, we've got everything we need to, to get that static test done, but we'll be spending a lot of money on magnets, and a lot of money on, on our vacuum equipment. We have to. Come 2027, we want to say to our aerospace partners, the people we already sell equipment to, because we listen to them and we know that they want fusion propulsion. It is one of the things they are most interested in in our portfolio. And if they, you know, if, if we come up with a technology that they don't want, we don't invest in it. You know, we don't have a dream that we want to build something and people are going to want it. We say they don't want it, we don't want to build it, but they want this. So we, we keep them involved in the game and we invite them to come and see these tests at low temperature, higher temperature. The thing is, we, we build this all to scale, because I think that if you build something on a tabletop and say it's a big aerospace firm, do you want to come and look at it? They'll say, well, it's not really the size that you would need it. So it might be interesting, but it's, you know, so our, our, our experiments are full size, um, as if the real rocket, and we'll start with a low temperature plasma. I say low temperature, I mean a couple of million uh, degrees. And then as we bring up our magnetic power, we will get towards fusion temperatures, and then we will throw those exhaust speeds to our, our to the people in the, in the space sector, and and, uh, and then hopefully we will they will see the sense in putting this in orbit, um, which I, I think there's a, a, a very good case for. Excellent. And finally, what is your biggest hope for this technology for the future? What do you hope it brings about? In terms of change for yeah. people, for yeah, yeah. You know, for me, there's, there's all sorts of positive impacts, but why? what drives me to do this? Um, yeah. You know, it, it's a, it's sometimes it's when you know something is possible, uh, it becomes almost irresistible. Um, but you've got to be very careful <laughs> because just because, to quote Jurassic Park, 
uh, so, sometimes your scientists have got to ask not if they could, but whether or not they should. Um, and, and in this case, uh, it comes down to the fact that humanity could be um, a, a nasty little defect of um, the, you know, something that this one planet has, has humaned and um, it's just not normal and we're gonna, we're like a cancerous little species that will, a planet's got to cough off and get rid of, um, maybe. Or, you know, maybe many, many planets have humans, you know, the, um, the, the world, the universe works in a way where it says, I tell you what, something may be very, very unlikely, but have a hundred trillion, trillion, trillion suns all planeting and the numbers will be there. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe, but we don't know that. We, we're like a child growing up alone. We don't have other, a big brother. We don't, we can't look at a human species that's maybe a hundred thousand years old or or we don't have a little planet over there that's only got, we can say, ah, well, they are where we were uh, 20,000 years ago. We, mm -hmm. because of light speed, effectively, we're that child growing up alone with a lot of insecurities about it. Because we don't know, oh, look, we're in our teens and we still smoke and we know we shouldn't. And we're kind of getting better, but we're, you know, we're, we can't look at, let's say, that old, mature, wise civilization that they have learned how to find a planet near them and they put a responsible civilization uh, you know they know how many people it can sustain and they power it properly and that's a mature human species and we will one day get like that so insecurities for me fusion technology is that is a milestone in us growing up as a species mm. it's our ability to emulate what the stars are doing knowing that okay we've learned and we've set fire to stuff and we we've, we've definitely made a mess but now we're doing what the stars are doing, what the sun is doing, and we're copying nature, and we're using it A, to power our planet, ultimately, sustainably, for so long as there is humanity. But also, we are, if you look at that little, forget all the grand talk, if you go right back to the lab, and you see a fusion burn, that is the promise that we are that species that, that can leave our solar system. Maybe not maybe we don't send people, maybe, maybe we send embryos or maybe we send uh, a, uh, a system AI powered that probes, a AI powered, or maybe uh, we send something that goes across to Alpha Centauri, who's about 4.2 light years away. And, and that then breeds humans, but only enough on that, who knows, but that reaction, that fusion reaction, which we've done means we are that species. And that is pretty extraordinary. That is indeed pretty extraordinary. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Richard. It was a pleasure talking with you. My pleasure. Love to have you back anytime. Thank you. And that was Richard Dynan, founder and CEO of Pulsar Fusion.